Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to another uh, session on Surah Al-Anbiya, where I share some, some reflections on, uh, on the verses. We reached uh, verse 16, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ and we did not create heaven and earth and whatever is between them in play. The verse begins with a, uh, a harf, a, a, a particle of negation. Harfu nafyin, wama, and we did not create. And as a side note, many verses in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala employs the plural pronoun, the pronoun of we. And of course, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a singular entity. He is absolute in his oneness. But in the Arabic language, and in fact, in most languages, the plural pronoun of we sometimes is used to indicate royalty and majesty. You know, in the same way in the Arabic language, when we greet one another, even if you're addressing one person, you say assalamu alaykum with, you don't say assalamu alayka, you use the plural as a gesture, as an expression of respect. So this is a verse that involves the, the jalal of Allah, the majesty of God. So whenever Allah uses this plural, know that what follows is going to be a reference to uh, some of his attributes of, of majesty. وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ We did not create heaven, meaning a reference to the skies, nor the earth, nor what is between them in play. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create anything without purpose. Nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created has been created in vain. Every single creature, every single angel, every single jinn, every single human being, every single plant, every particle of dust, every atom, every subatomic particle, everything has been created with purpose, with meaning, it has a function, it serves a role in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So Allah says that we did not create the heavens, the universe, creation as a game for amusement. Because the word la'ib in Arabic refers to a frivolous activity. You know, like when you see a toddler playing a game, they're just doing it for the sake of amusement. It doesn't have a higher purpose. Allah says, I have not created anything frivolously. Everything has meaning, it has purpose. And then, therefore, the question that naturally arises, that if, if Allah says that we did not create heaven and earth and whatever is between them in play, that it has a purpose, that there's wisdom behind it, the next question that naturally arises is, what is the purpose of heaven and earth? What is the purpose of the universe? Now, interestingly, when you go to Surah, and this is one of the beauties of the Qur'an, is that the Qur'an explains itself. You know, it raises an issue in one verse, and then the completion of that idea, that thought, is found in another verse. Al-Qur'an ba'dhuhu yufassiru ba'dha. That the Qur'an explains itself. And this is, you know, essentially the, uh, the mode of tafsir that is employed by Allama Tawatabai. You know, he'll find it. A word, for example, the word ruh in one verse, and then he'll collect all of the other verses that use the word ruh in an attempt to unpack the verse that he's uh, that he's looking at. So, what is the the perp? Why did Allah create the sun, the moon, the plants, the heavens, the earth? Allah answers this question in verse number thirteen of Surah Al Jathiya, Surah number forty-five. Ayah number 13. 
where he says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مِنْهُ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكْرُونَ One of the primary functions, one of the primary purposes of the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between them is that Allah has created the heavens and the earth to be subservient to man, to human beings. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored the insan, Bani Adam, to such an extent that he says, not only have I created the earth to be subservient to human beings, Allah says, I have made subservient the heavens, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا That everything in the universe directly or indirectly has been created to serve the human being, to benefit him in some way, even if we're not able to perceive of the way that we benefit from, from certain creatures. Allah says, it was all created for you, to serve you, for your comfort, for your leisure for your benefit. So the heavens and the earth were created to be subservient to humanity. Now the question is, what was the human being created for? Allah says in Surah al dhariyat Surah 51, verse 56, in the famous verse, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn and men except that so that they worship me. So the heavens and the earth were created for man, but the human being was created for God, for Ubudiyya. Because servitude to God is the only way for this creature known as the insan to experience maximum, unlimited, enduring happiness and prosperity. Now, what was the motivation? Now, if Allah did not create, if Allah does not need, if he's needless, if he's self-sufficient. So we've, we've spoken about why God has created the heavens and the earth, what service, what purpose they serve. And that is, they were made subservient to, to the human race. Why, was, why did Allah create, what is the benefit behind the creation of the human being? To achieve unlimited eternal happiness through the vehicle of Ubudiyya. But what was the divine motive? Why did Allah create creation? Allah answers this in Surah Hud, verses 118 and 119. Allah says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ If Allah willed, He could have made all of humanity one nation. Meaning they would, have, they would have had the same ideology, the same belief system, and they would not have disputed. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ ربك, The only ones who are spared, who are protected from this ikhtilaf. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ ربك, Except those whom God has had mercy upon. وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ And it is for that reason that he created them. Meaning he created them purely out of his mercy. So the divine motive behind creation is mercy. Allah has no, there's no benefit for him. That his mercy dictates that, that he must create. It's not that he's compelled to do it, but to fulfill, to realize the, the quality of his rahmah, it necessitates that he creates. And you find that Allah, at every moment he's creating. At every moment, there is a flower. There is a flower that is budding. There is a, a blade of grass that is is uh, is spouting. That you know, at, at every moment, a child is being conceived. That creation is constantly being renewed. That God is constantly creating, bringing things into existence. So Allah created the heavens and the earth primarily to be subservient to human beings. He created human beings to worship him. 
because through worship they will be able to attain eternal prosperity and the divine motive behind creation is mercy that Allah wanted to expose his creatures to his grace and to his goodness and to his love God did not create the heaven the heaven and earth and what is in between them in play Allah does not need amusement you know this is one of the differences between God and his creation you know why do we need amusement you know why is it that we need to take a vacation once or twice a year it's because we get we get tired we get exhausted the the monotony of, of everyday life takes a toll on us so we need amusement because we're human because we can't we can't we can't withstand that constant toil but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of lahib. He doesn't need amusement. He doesn't need to entertain himself. There's no need for him that needs to be fulfilled. If you go to Surah Ar-Rahman, Surah 55, verse 29, Allah says, man fis Everything that is in the heavens and the earth is in a state of su'al. It is constantly seeking God, asking Him, imploring Him for His grace, for His mercy, for His sustenance. So at every moment, Allah says, Kul huwa fi shan. At every moment, He is engaged with His creation. So there's no, Allah doesn't need a break. He doesn't need a holiday. He doesn't need rest. He doesn't need amusement. He is the all powerful, the Almighty who does not grow tired of, of fulfilling the needs of his creation. Everything has purpose. Everything was created to serve a particular function. So this verse is a reminder that there is accountability, that this is not all a game. You were created for a purpose and you have, to, you have to discover what your purpose is. You have to know that it would be frivolous for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create this vast universe just so we can live for 50, 60 years and we perish and that's the end of it. It's not a game. But there's, a, there's a purpose behind this, uh, this creation. In verse number 17, Allah says, لَوْ أَرَدْنَا أَن نَتَّخِذَ لَهْوًا لَتَّخَذْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا إِنْ كُنَّا فَاعِلُونَ Allah says, had we desired to take up entertainment, we would surely have taken it from that which is with us, were we to do so. So here, the verse begins with لَوْ, you know, if. So here Allah is going to present a hypothetical. A very wild hypothetical. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, because those, because a lot of the polytheists, the mushrikeen of Mecca, they rejected the notion of a hereafter. And if you argue that there is no hereafter, that human beings will not be held accountable for what they did, you are essentially saying that this creation, that the world, the universe, was created in vain, that it's all just a game and there's no accountability, that God just created it for his amusement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying that if, if Allah were to entertain himself, now again, this is a very wild hypothetical, but let's, let's assume that God wanted to entertain himself, that he wanted to amuse himself. He would use something his source of amusement would be something that is befitting for his majesty. It was something that would be suitable for the Lord of the worlds. It would not be something that is, that is limited to the, the material world. It would not be dunya. You know, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salam, he says about dunya, innama summiyat ad-dunya dunyan li annaha adna min kulli shay. That this world, this physical realm is called dunya because dunya means something that is low. 
And there is nothing, there is no phase of existence that is lower than dunya. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to amuse himself, you think he's going to amuse himself the same way that human beings amuse themselves? It's like the difference between how an adult entertains themselves and how a toddler will entertain himself. If you give a toddler, you know, a rubber band, the toddler will be amused for a half an hour, for an hour, for a long time. If you give him a rubber band, but if you give a rubber band to an adult, that's not going to amuse them. That what amuses an adult is much more sophisticated than what will amuse a child. So similarly here, the idea here is that you have to understand who God is and who you are. Allah is not like you. Allah is not amused and he's not entertained by the things that have captivated you. In kunna fa'in, if we were to do so and we would never do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. He's beyond this need for entertainment, for amusement. And if he were to entertain himself, whatever that thing would be, it would have to be compatible with his attributes that Allah is wise, he's, he's justice, he's pure, he's transcendent. So hypothetically, what would amuse him would have to be so sophisticated that it would be beyond our imagination. It would not be, you know, the material world and its, its, its iridescent glitter. In verse number 18, Allah says, بَلْ نَقْذِفُ بِالْحَقِّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ فَيَدْمَغُهُ فَإِذَا هُوَ زَاهِقٌ وَلَكُمُ الْوَيْلُ مِمَّا تَصِفُونَ Nay, but we cast truth upon falsehood, and it crushes it, and behold, it vanishes, and woe unto you for that which you describe. So, in verse number 16, as we mentioned, Allah says that we've not, we have not created anything in vain, that it has a purpose, that there is, there is accountability. And the two most simple realities of, of creation is this constant struggle between haq and batil. So we said that Allah created the heavens and the earth to be subservient to man. And because human beings have free will, they have the freedom to uphold truth and justice, and they have the freedom to uphold falsehood and evil. So because of the existence of creatures that possess free will, you have, you have these elements of truth and falsehood. You have this ongoing struggle between haq and batil. Now, before I get into the verse itself, if you look at the, the linguistic meaning of the word haq, you'll find that the literal meaning of haq is something that is firm, something that is solid. That's the literal meaning of the word haq. It means something that is strong, something that is firm, something that is solid. And the word batil, which means falsehood, the original, the, the literal meaning of the word batil is something that is not firm, something that is precarious, something that is shaky, that doesn't have a strong foundation, something that's wobbly. That is the literal meaning of batil. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is speaking about the natural outcome, the reality, the, the relationship between truth and falsehood. Allah says, بَلْ نَقْذِفُ بِالْحَقِّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ نَقْذِفْ قَذَفَ is to throw something. And so, so imagine, imagine, you know, truth and falsehood as two soldiers. And you have truth throwing. So Allah is saying that I throw truth 
upon falsehood that you know when you throw something because of the velocity there's there's a strong impact allah says bal naqdhifu bil haqq ala al batil that we throw down you know just to illustrate the relationship between truth and falsehood the natural outcome of this struggle is that truth will prevail but how will it prevail naqdhifu bil haqq ala al batil so imagine truth being dropped down being thrown down upon batil it crushes it so allah says we take the truth and we throw it down we slam it upon batil there's an interesting verse in surah al-ra'd surah al-ra'd is surah number 13 verse 17 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, he gives a, an analogy that, that really highlights the relationship between haqq and batil. Allah says, أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَسَالَتْ أَوْدِيَةٌ بِقَدَرِهَا He sends down rain, he sends down water from the sky so that the riverbeds flow according to their measure. So rain, imagine rain falling. You know, it's been dry, rain falls, and it fills up these valleys, these riverbeds, in accordance to their measure. What happens when it hasn't rained for a long time? You know, when it's been dry for a long time, you get a lot of dirt, a lot of dust, a lot of debris. And Allah says, and the torrent carries a swelling froth a swelling froth is kind of like that foam that that appears at the top of a flowing current and that froth is a collection of that that rubbish that scum that debris wa mimma yuqiduna alayhi fi an-nar ittigha'a hiliyatan aw mata you know if you it's and it's similar to this is when you when you take a piece of gold you know gold in its natural form is like it's like a piece of rock and oftentimes it's mixed with other metals or other impurities how do you separate pure gold from those other metals you melt it and when you melt it the gold settles at the bottom and what you have on the top is that that mixture of contaminants so allah says in the same way that the when the water comes, it carries this froth, this foam on the top. Similarly, when you melt gold, you have the impurities on the top. Seeking ornament or pleasure is a froth like it. Thus does God set forth truth and falsehood. So this is an, an allegory for truth and falsehood. As for froth, as for the zabad, Allah says, فَأَمَّا فَيَذْهَبُ جُفَاءً that This scum, this foam that is flowing on top, as for the froth, it passes away as scum. It goes away. وَأَمَّا مَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسِ فَيَمْكُثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ as for that which benefits man, it remains on the earth. So here you notice that truth comes down with force. So it, 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 the water comes from the sky. Haq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it comes with force. And it carries this foam and this scum on top. So you see that batil is so weak that it is always dependent on haq. It can't stand on its own. It's on the surface. It rides on the, on the coattails of truth. But it vanishes. Allah says, يَذْهَبُ جُفَاءً it, it goes away. You know, in the same, you know when you pour a glass of Coke and you have that, that foam, that fizz? It, it vanishes quickly. Allah says that's the nature of batil. It doesn't last. And what is beneficial endures. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about haq and batil, he says, we cast truth upon falsehood. Fayadmaghuhu. Fayadmaghu is to literally, it's a verb that means to, to crush a skull so, so forcefully that you get to the brain. The, the skull shatters and the brain, you get down to the brain because the word for brain is damag. Fayadmaghuhu. That that's how powerful haq is, that it, it obliterates batlin. فَإِذَا هُوَ زَاهِقٌ and, and this is, this is, you know, to really lift the morale of the Prophet and the Muslims. That yes, it may seem that they have the upper hand, that your enemies have the upper hand, but the nature, the natural outcome of this struggle of haq and batil is that haq is going to de demolish falsehood, that it's going to annihilate it in the end. فَإِذَا هُوَ زَاهِقُ The word zahiq means to be gone without a trace. You know, sometimes you might destroy. So if you think of haq and batil as two armies, you know, it's one thing to defeat an army. Allah is not just saying that batil will be defeated. Allah says that it will become zahiq. It will be crushed. It will be annihilated. So much so that it's at, it will leave no trace. It will be gone without a trace. Allah in Surah Al-Isra, He says in Surah uh, 17 verse 81, again, this, this, uh, this word zahiq is used. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ When truth comes, وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ That batil is vanquished. إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا the nature of falsehood is that it is vanquished, that it vanishes. You know, it's very similar to darkness and light. You know, if you're in a dark room and someone turns on the light, what happens to the darkness? Do we have to push the darkness out of the room? Do we have to put the darkness in a closet? Is the darkness still there? No. When light is turned on, the darkness vanishes. It's as though it never existed. There's no trace of it anymore. Because that's the power of haq. That's the power of truth. And that's why you find throughout history, tyrants, oppressors have always tried to censor the truth. Right? I mean, that, that's why... The event of Ghadir, you know, today we celebrate the uh, Eid al-Ghadir. Why is Eid al-Ghadir so frightening to so many people? Because when truth is revealed, it's, it's too powerful to contain. That's why you have oppressive governments employ censorship and propaganda. They want to twist the truth. They want to conceal the truth because the truth is inherently powerful. That when truth arrives, it demolishes, it annihilates falsehood. And subhanAllah, even on an individual level, you know, you might live a life of sin, but when you embrace the truth, it's as though your past never existed. You know, that's why when someone becomes Muslim, Allah, you know, their, their past is forgiven. It's as if it never happened. Islam Islam washes away what happened in the past. Because Islam is haq and whatever batil existed in your life is completely annihilated. You take you take as an example someone like Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar was not always a saint. Abu Dhar was abandoned. He lived a life of sin before he became Muslim. But when you speak about Abu Dhar, you don't think about how he lived his life in Jahiliya. The only thing that we know about, the only thing that comes to mind when we speak about Abu Dhar is his honesty, his truthfulness, his devotion to the truth, his faith, his piety. So that part of his life has completely vanquished 
his previous life. And this is the nature of truth. It's the nature of goodness. Allah says in Surah Hud, verse 114, sayyat, that good deeds push away, they repel evil deeds. At the end of the verse. And woe be unto you for that which you described. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, wail is, is an expression of, some say it's a, it's a valley in Jahannam, but others also say that it's an expression of pity. That Allah, he pities you because of how you perceive the world, because of what you say about God, about life, about the hereafter. That your perception, your understanding of, of your existence, of life, of death, of the hereafter, of God, of creation, is worthy of pity. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse number 19, وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِهِ وَلَا يَسْتَحْسِرُونَ To him belongs whosoever is in the heavens and on the earth. Those who are with him are not too arrogant to worship him, nor do they weary. This verse is interesting because of the sentence structure. In normal Arabic, the, the, the normal way of, of of saying this sentence would be to, to say, وَمَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَهُ You know, whatever is in the heavens and the earth belongs to him. But the verse begins with, وَلَهُ And to him belong whatever is in the heavens and on the earth. And when you have, when you put the predicate before the subject, that is done. This is called تَقْدِيم and تَأْخِيرُ you know, to put the subject in front of the uh, the predicate or, or vice versa. This is done to convey exclusivity. So if the verse were to say, whatever is in the heavens and the earth belongs to him, that doesn't negate that it also might belong to someone else. So if I say that this car belongs to me, I'm not negating that it could also belong to my wife. But when you say, وَلَهُ And to him belongs the heavens and the earth. If you put the predicate in front of the subject, it denotes exclusivity. To him alone belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. And keep in mind that Allah is addressing who? He's addressing mushrikeen, individuals who are, who are unwilling to give up their objects of shirk, their objects of worship. Allah is basically telling them that even the idols that you worship belong to me. The money that you worship belongs to me. Whatever you think of as a human being that gives you solace, that gives you comfort, it belongs to me. And that's the interesting reality of shirk. Shirk is basically creation, worshiping creation. That's the reality of shirk. Shirk is... Creation, worshiping creation. The needy seeking the needy. The limited seeking the limited. The imperfect seeking the imperfect. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that everything belongs exclusively to me. Why don't you want to worship God? Those who are with him, a reference to the angels, because even angels became an object of shirk. Allah says, لا يستكبرون. They are not too arrogant to worship. They don't find themselves too high to worship God. And they do not grow tired. They do not grow weary. You know, if you look at the, if you look at the phenomenon of shirk, you know, especially among monotheistic traditions, one of the biggest objects of shirk in the world today is Isa ibn Maryam. Isa alayhi salam is an object of shirk. When Allah, when Allah speaks about Isa in the Quran, what does he say in Surah An-Nisa verse 172? He says, لَن يستنكف المسيح أن يكون عبدا لله ولا الملائكة المقربون. 
that Isa is not ashamed of worshiping God. He's not, he doesn't find himself too refined and great to worship God. He's honored to be an Abd of Allah, as well as the angels. So the angels are not too arrogant to worship God, and they do not grow weary. They do not grow tired of worshiping Him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, In verse number 20, you said, Bihuna Layla wa Nahar. Now, here Allah is describing the Malaika. You said, Bihuna Layla wa Nahar, Wala Yaftawun. They glorify night and day without tiring. Tasbih is mentioned. So Allah mentions that they worship him. They're not, they're not too arrogant to worship. They do not grow weary. They don't get bored. Ibadah is not monotonous to them. And they do tasbih. You know, one of the, the main activities of angels is what? It's tasbih. You said, and they, they glorify. They do tasbih day and night. The word tasbih is an interesting word because it comes from the verb sabaha. The word sabaha means to swim. And sabaha is a type of swimming where your head stays above the water. When you swim in a way where your head is above water, in Arabic, we say sabaha. Sabaha. Now, what's the relationship between why did the Arabs use this type of verb? Why is the word for tasbih derived from that verb? So sabaha means to swim in a way where your head is above water. Similarly, tasbih, glorifying God, is what helps us stay spiritually afloat. So in the same way that swimming, when you swim, your head is your head stays afloat. That's what that's what the word sabaha means. That when you glorify God, when you declare his perfection, that you are staying spiritually afloat. And the angels do this day and night. There's a, there's a hadith from the Prophet and it's in fact the Prophet's wasiya to Abu Dhar. The Prophet was once sitting with, with Abu Dhar and actually Abu Dhar enters the masjid and he finds Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Prophet sitting alone. So he takes advantage of the fact that the Prophet is not surrounded by a crowd and he goes to ask the Prophet for some advice. And the Prophet gives him, you know, a very lengthy wasiya. One of the things that the Prophet mentions is related to malaika. You know, for us not to be arrogant and not to, you know, exaggerate our, our worship. You know, sometimes we perform Salatul Layl for a few weeks and we think that we've become something great. The Prophet says, Ya Abba Dha. Inna lillahi malaikatan qiyaman min khifatillah. O Abu Dhar, Allah has angels who are standing out of fear of God. Ma rafa'u ru'usahum hatta yunfakhu fi sur an nafkh al akhirah. That they are in worship and they have not raised their heads from worship. And they will not raise their hats from worship until the trumpet is sound, meaning until the day of judgment begins. فَيَقُولُونَ جَمِيعًا سُبْحَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَبِحَمْدِكَ مَا عَبَدْنَاكَ كَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَكَ أَنْ تُعْبَدْ So you have these angels who are standing in worship, who are bowing, who are prostrating, and they stay in that position, and they will not raise their hats from that position until the day of judgment. And on the day of judgment, they will say, 
glory be to you and praise be to you. We have not worshipped you as you deserve to be worshipped. So it's important for us to keep this in mind, you know, for our, our own spiritual development, that we don't allow arrogance to creep into our hearts because malaika, angels, they are constantly engaged in this act of tasbih. You said, They glorify God night and day. You know, it's, it's very natural. When you want to say that something is happening 24 hours, we usually say what? Day and night. I'm doing this day and night. But here Allah says they do tasbih night and day. Allah mentions night first. Why? Some have said that because this is the optimal time to do tasbih. That night time is, is a prime time to do dhikr, to do tasbih. And this is why Allah, when he speaks to the Prophet in Surah Al-Muzzammil, Ya ayyuha al-Muzzammil, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِصْفَهُ وَوَنْقُصْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْ زِدْتَ عَلَيْهِ وَرَتِّ لِلْقُرْآنِ تَرْتِيلًا إِنَّ نَاشِئَةَ اللَّيْلِ هِيَ أَشَدُّ وَطْأًا وَأَقْوَى مُقِينًا That, that worshipping at, at night time is, is the most effective. Now, Allah says, وَلَا يَفْتَرُونَ And they do not become tired. Now, we know, brothers and sisters, that malaika that angels, they don't only do tasbih. Allah has commissioned certain angels to record our deeds. There are certain angels that are in charge of rizq. You have Malakul Maut, you have Jibra'il. Angels have other activities. So how do we reconcile the fact that they have other activities and they're always doing tasbih? The answer is, there's an interesting hadith from Imam al-Sadiq about the tasbih of angels. Now, you and I, you know, we do many things, but there's one thing that we're always doing throughout the day, and that is what? Breathing. You're driving your car, you're breathing. You're playing sports, you're breathing. You're at the office at work, you're breathing. You're having dinner with your family, you're breathing. So you're doing all of these activities, but the one thing that you're doing throughout the day is what? Breathing. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, the breathing of malaika is tasbih and fasuhum tasbih. So breathing for us is this exchange, inhaling oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide. But malaika, because they are these subtle creatures, they are immaterial, they're not like us, their breathing is tasbih. They never grow tired. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that to these mushrikeen that, that number one, I have not created the heavens and the earth in vain. There's a purpose. Everything has a purpose. You were created for a purpose. And there is this constant struggle between haq and batil and haq will crush batil. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he speaks about this idea of everything belonging to him, that you and even your objects of shirk belong to me. And why do you refuse to worship me? Don't you know that the malaika, those who are close to me, are constantly engaged in my ibadah. يُسَبِّحُونَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّهَارُ وَلَا يَفْتَرُونَ Inshallah, we'll, uh, we'll end here as the, uh, the verses that are next require a bit more analysis. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين So we can take uh, questions and answers if anyone has any. Assalamualaikum yeah, Shaykh. Um, so uh, the Quran says that our purpose is about it. But there are many forms of ibadat beyond the traditional worship. Uh, many, there are many good things like helping others or even just earning a living for yourself. Yeah. How do we reconcile um, all these different things that are not necessarily even um, directly worshipping Allah, which is with uh, this global purpose for mankind? So when it comes to the, the issue of, uh, of ibadah, 
Ibada was is always meant, it always refers to the broader sense of Ibada. So when we say Ibada, we're not just talking about praying or recitation. We're not talking about dua and salah necessarily. That anything that is done seeking nearness to God is a type of ibadah. And people are different. You know, this is why the Prophet says, Inna turuqa Allah that the pathways that lead to God are as numerous as the breaths of his creation. So, and all of them are types of ibadah. And people are different. You know, there are there are certain people, their personality. You know, they're more inclined towards certain types of ibadah than others. And that doesn't make them bad. It just makes them different. So there are some people that are more inclined to to do dua, to do extra prayers. That is the way that they want to, you know, excel in their ibadah. There are other people that are, are more inclined towards, you know, community service, you know, charitable acts. So you see that they do more volunteering. That is, that is their ibadah. There are others who are more inclined, they're more interested in teaching, for example, disseminating knowledge. You know, they're, they're good at communicating and, and teaching others. They're good instructors. And this is, this is how they want to excel in, in their ibadah. Now, Allah doesn't expect us to excel in everything. At the end of the day, we're human. But the point is that all of these different activities are forms of ibadah. And you have to ask yourself that what are you inclined towards? What are you interested in? And you use your skill set, your respective skill set, to, to excel in, in your ibadah, whatever it may be. So w- would it be uh, an accurate summarization to say that doing not not committing sins or staying away from the evils that the Quran has said. Uh, That's the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum. So doing the wajibat and avoiding the muhammad, this is the bare minimum of, of ubudiyya. But beyond that, Allah has really left it up to us on, you know, what what is it that you want to do to kind of reach uh, your full potential as his abd. It's, it's interesting because this is tying in to the concept of uh, what actually makes people happy or what, what, what's going to give people your long-term happiness as you kind of make. And, and it might be different. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, it, it could be different things. You know, what, what, what makes me happy in my, in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be different from yours. You know, I might be satisfied with just doing the bare minimum daily prayers but I want to give a lot of my money. I want to give a lot of my time. Someone might be more moderate when it comes to charity, but you know they, they really enjoy the du'as and the recitation of the Quran and the teaching. And both of them, both of them are good. You know, it's it's kind of like you know, when the Prophet entered the masjid, he saw two groups of people: those who were engaged in, in du'a and prayer, and those who were engaged in learning. They were studying. They were seeking knowledge. Both of them, both groups were in a state of ubudiyah. They were, they were, they're both in a state of worship. But the Prophet ﷺ joined those who were seeking knowledge because that's what, what he preferred. So people are different. And we shouldn't assume that, that, that ubudiyah is going to look the same uh, across the board. So people are going to be different. And Allah has given us different abilities different talents. So we all have a very unique spiritual personality. And that even goes for the prophets. You know, the prophets are all infallible, but they're, they're all spiritually unique. You know, they, they excel at, uh, at certain things more than others in comparison to each other. That's interesting. It goes back to kind of the, or going back to the idea of purpose and that this is what gives you, or that, Allah created us for this purpose, but even then everyone kind of has their own um, searching to do to find their individual purposes. Exactly, exactly. Sheikh, well, uh, thank you very much. This is a, this topic is a very, very interesting one and one that keeps coming up a lot of the times. 
Alhamdulillah, I, I, I'm, re I'm really enjoying the, uh, you know, just the, uh, the topics uh, in this surah. And I think there's a lot more to come that's going to be very, uh, it's going to be very uh, insightful. And uh, it's, it's going to raise a lot of very interesting issues. So inshallah, we all benefit. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate inshallah. this. Inshallah. Take care. Fiamat.